As you know, um, we decided yesterday that we would not be continuing our conversations to uh, acquire the Kentucky One uh, CHI Common Spirit properties. I just thought that I would maybe just walk you through a couple of um, steps of how we got here and then open it up for questions. I hope, as John said, that's, that's the plan. On December 29 of 2018 is when we entered into a non-binding uh, LOI with uh, Kentucky One. What prompted this, as you all know, is that we were concerned about what would happen uh, with uh, potential closing of facilities or buyers that might come in that are not completely committed to the community. And so we had a long discussion at that time internally and thought we owed it as the University of Louisville to the community to try, that we really had an obligation to do that. And um, we knew that from that point on that neither of it was an exclusive. As that's the emphasis that I wanted to say, is that they were continuing to look at other partners. We had to continue to look at what we would do. That's just good business practice. But we were very enthusiastic about the potential. Um, we devoted over 100 people to this and spent uh, significant amounts of money, as you might imagine, in a deal of this scale. And as we went through it, went through a pretty robust process, we had a public RFP process, as you know, and when we didn't get the responses that we wanted through that process, we uh, engaged our investment banker to go through a confidential information memorandum or a SIM and try to pursue other potential partners to work with us to make this deal happen. In that process, the offers that we got um, were not ones that would make it viable for us. I've said this to you once before, we know that our most important obligation is to the University of Louisville. We, I, as the leader of this university and the board, needs to make sure that we are financially viable, sustainable, and that we thrive. That was always very important to us. And I've made the analogy of when you're flying, you know how they say, first put your mask on first before you assist the person next to you. And the point is that we need to make sure that we stay financially viable throughout this process. And all I can tell you is that during the process, uh, it didn't turn out that we uh, had attractive options, partners that could come in with us. And with our financial situation, or with any, any universities, to go on this alone, uh, given the financial straits of Kentucky One properties uh, was not a viable option for us. Um, then we decided that we needed to do this quickly, that once we made a decision that it was important to just state it and so that there was no uh, misguiding anybody or delaying a process for the good of the order. The good news is that they have been, we are both parties are truly committed to an orderly transition. And so while this might be very um, nerve wracking for many people, uncertainty is always that way, change is always that way. What I'm happy to tell you is that all of our agreements have been extended with no real end date. So our AAA, our MSA, the caveat is that we would have to be given a 90 day notice if that were not to happen. And we are very reassured for the students' education, for our residents, that for whatever reason, a sale uh, to another buyer who may not be interested in the same thing, we have an agreement that all of those residency slots would be transferred to us or to a location of our choosing. So what does this mean? From an education point of view, the students are protected. Our agreements are all in place. So for our doctors, other healthcare providers that are working in these facilities, Nothing is uh, imminent, there's no problem. I'm sure you'll all ask me, uh, what about the long term? And you've heard from uh, uh, Kentucky One that long term they cannot say, but there are no plans to immediately shut down any of the facilities. So that, that's what I wanted to share with you and I'm happy to take any questions. 
can you describe in any detail what actually occurred during the negotiations when, it, when you say that it was not financially viable? Hmm. What specifically are you referring to? I'm referring to a couple of things. One is uh, finding a partner that would invest the dollars to make sure that we could run all these hospitals in a sustainable manner. And as you know, with many of these, there would be fresh infusions of cash that would be required for deferred maintenance, for IT, for a lot of those types of things. And during a negotiation process, you realize whether it's possible to come to an agreement or not. And in this case, you know, it wasn't. I hope that you all also recall that for a deal of this magnitude in five months, to be able to say yay or nay is a, a really big deal. How much money are we talking about here? Um, it's hard to say. I don't want to pinpoint a particular number, but we were looking for a partner that would keep this viable. And during the process, um, we had three potential suitors that were in the data rooms and were trying to see if this would work but in a time frame to move quickly enough, they all need it significantly longer. I'm not avoiding your question, but candidly what it is is that how much is required would actually depend on the structure of the deal. Do you see? Because if we said how much equity would we give up, what would happen? That's why I'm not able to tell you. So if someone came in and we said it's we just want 10%, it would look very different from if we were going to be equal partners. I, I don't know if I can. Let me find out from our legal. Uh, we went through a process, maybe we can. Can you, let me find out about that. I just honestly don't know if we could. So t time obviously was a major factor here. So at least thinking about maybe a different world where you maybe had more time, would you have been able to find a partner that would have been suitable? It's possible, uh, but that's speculative. We felt during the uh, negotiating process that the due diligence that these, par these partners would want. As you know, our memorandum went out somewhere in the first week of May. We asked for proposals to be due by end of May. So this is a super compressed time frame. Right, right. so I mean, it's, in, it's probably, I would assume, in the best interest of Kentucky One, CHI, and the Common Spirit to actually come to terms with whoever that they're working with, and they've obviously shown that they've willing to give at least Blue Mountain any amount of time that they want. Blue Mountain's been at the table for, I mean, well over a year. Why wasn't Common Spirit and everybody else that on the Kentucky One side willing to give the University of Louisville more time to find viable partners? Those are questions that are hard for me to answer, right? Uh, we can say that from our end, uh, we knew that within the time frame allowed that the financials weren't uh, making sense. Some, of, some people might say, why did you even enter into it? You know, But we really thought that it was important to give it everything we had to try, right? How close were you in the discussion? So if, if the goal is saying the venture requires a billion, um, were you 50% there, 75%? How, how close were you? Uh, again, the, that question is impossible to answer because it depends on the deal structure. Everywhere. What are, what are they going to ask in terms of um, capital calls? What are they going to do in terms of dilution of potential equity? It's, it's, I can't get there. All I'm saying is that the offers that we were getting were not ones that would have made it viable for us. Too far apart. To clarify something. Um, Say down the road, Kentucky One finds a partner, uh, and that partner is not interested in extending your agreement. Would you clarify what happens then as far as you're concerned? Sure. Uh, as I told you, there's a minimum of a 90-day notice that we would have to be given that there is a potential partner. because, And even then, that's the minimum that they would have to give. Uh, I'm confident that given the long history in this community and the importance of it, it would actually be a very orderly process. The, 
we would have a plan, which we've been doing just like they have been doing. This wasn't an exclusive agreement on either side. So I don't want you to think that for five months they were waiting just for us to do the deal or that for five months all we did was just this deal. So we have been doing contingency planning. So none of our programs are at risk. We will have to find alternative locations for the services we provide. Or maybe, sorry, or maybe a potential buyer would say, we want to work, work with us. That's possible. Right, so if a potential buyer wants to continue you know, these, this close relationship and the agreements that you have now, great, there's no problem there. But if you have a newcomer into the community who wants to take over these facilities but is not interested in them, how do you guarantee their protection? Because a lot of these are funded through ag agreements with Kentucky, Kentucky One. If right. they go away, how do you support the program? We um, the way programs are supported, you're right. If they say uh, that they are going to shut down a facility, then what we would do is we would move our programs. As you know, that we would have new academic affiliation agreements with places that we would practice, and there are master service agreements for the services we provide. We would have to find a different partner, a different location for these services. And it's not like you have a, you know, a Las Vegas South buffet you know, list of partners to go with. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us at this point where your best, where your best chance is to have a good contingency plan? You know, in our contingency planning, we've been looking at what can we move within our facilities, and we are looking at the other health systems in town. So, surprise, surprise, if you didn't know, it's Norton and Baptist, so we are going to, be, we've been thinking about those as well. Has Jewish, um, has Jewish been using staff at all um, um, this process? You know, I'm, I don't know, because that's on their uh, employee roles. I know that there has been a lot of concern, and I just want, I hope, for the sake of the community, everybody is hearing that the very fact that they have signed an agreement with us with no end date for AAA and MSA, unlike before, and they're saying that will give us a 90-day notice, should give all of you some comfort that it's not everybody listening, watching, that it's not imminent, that tomorrow something will happen. Two-part question. Um, what was your level of confidence going into this uh, a few months ago, and uh, how surprising or disappointing is it that you could not find a partner? Um, I would say going in, we knew that uh, we had to look, that we really felt it was a moral obligation, that we as a university needed to try to keep this open. So I would say we went in thinking, given that from 2017 on or whatever, they were trying to find a partner, it, internally we knew that it would be a toss up whether we could do it, but it's one of those things where you say, will you be brave and say we'll at least try, or will we say we won't even. So I credit to my board and to our people that we said, we've got to at least try. Are we disappointed? Yes, because it would have been great to make things work. But I have to say that a lot of times discretion is the better part of valor. Looking at the numbers that we saw, we could not see how we would do it in a way that would not jeopardize the university. Have you had discussions with Norton and Baptist? They have been. Um, I reached out to both CEOs this morning, and as I said, I want you to realize this wasn't an exclusive all of this while. Clearly, for the past five months, all of our attention focus has been on can we make this work. A lot of it uh, has been um, the first couple of months are putting all the data into a data room, getting sure that our people can get in and look at it. We had to hire uh, Alvarez and Marcel to check out their numbers. Uh, then we have an investment banker look at our numbers. And you know, a lot of it when we say we've been working on it is really verifying the numbers that each of us is getting and saying can we get to a point where uh, it's possible that we would sell. So the conversations, as I've said, are not new. I mean, in contingency planning, that's what you do, right? Contingency planning is just that. If this happens, what will we do? If this doesn't happen, what will we do? Just like we would plan. If there's an announcement of a deal, how would we communicate it to you? If there was not, what would we do? It's just scenario planning. So none of it is starting from zero, because clearly we've all been thinking about this, as have they. 
You mentioned that uh, you spent quite a bit of money in this process. Can you see how much was spent by the university to try to make this happen? A, a lot of it was spent not on the university side, but on the hospital. Because remember, once we went through a public process, we had to switch to a private. I can get you that number. We're actually trying to quantify it. I can tell you it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, that we felt that we had to invest to see if there was a way. When you say it was on the part of the hospital, do you mean it was spent on the part of U of L hospital? Or you... Correct. Oh, our hospital. So it's a separate entity. So when I wanted to say, did it come from the university? It was really from our uh, hospital, UMC. You're know, looking forward. You have a uh, you know, very talented and I'm sure very qualified Tom Miller who leads University of Global Health. Uh, you know, he previously was the CEO of a large national system. Uh, <coughs> I'm sure you would have been a great asset to lead what could have been, you know, kind of a new turnkey mm -hmm. system in Louisville. Uh, is he going to continue on in his role overseeing the facilities that U of L does have now? I certainly hope so. Uh, we are uh, very fortunate to have, a, as you said, a very talented individual, and he has done such a great job for us in turning around the hospital. We are. Uh, actually in the black, doing very well. Um, those things needed to happen no matter what was going on. So, yeah. Part of, you know, the part of this, I mean, it's obviously the story, uh, you know, that kind of was part of the genesis of this was the separation of the University of Louisville Hospital from, you know, from Kentucky One. Hmm. Lots of, uh, you know, lots of uh, moving parts there, but it, based on just that one comment, it sounds like things are going really well at the hospital. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about you know how U of L Hospital is you know sparing on you know on its own a couple of years after it's, the fact? Uh, we we did, we had struggles. So I will say that um, as you know, I started in May and discovered that in the fall that we were not doing as we needed to, and there were a lot of issues: changeover, revenue cycle management, people. It's some of it is to be expected, but we thought we needed to really bring in some outstanding talent to figure out how to make this work. So I can tell you that yesterday, if you were to ask, we were absolutely full. The hospital, it's at capacity. For this venture, uh, what kind of help did you seek from Governor Bevan, uh, Mayor Fisher, and what did you receive? Um, all along, I have to say, local and state levels on both parties uh, we kept everybody in the loop. That was the most important thing at every step of the way. So the attorney general, the governor, the mayor, uh, at every step of the way we kept them in the loop of why we were going into this, what we thought would happen, and we didn't come out and talk to you about this, but to say, here's where we are. Uh, this is what happened with the public's um, RFP. Now here we are, we're entering to a private. And I have to say that they were all very supportive of the fact that we were entering this and very, very supportive of our decision that we would not pursue it. Did you seek financial help? Did they offer any? No, we did neither sought nor got any financial help. With, um, I know when you were looking for a partner, you guys definitely portrayed it as, you know, this isn't just about finding someone to finance the acquisition, this is about finding a partner to manage. Correct. And one option or, or one possibility you guys had mentioned was it could be not just finding a partner to manage Kentucky One's facilities, but finding a partner to help you manage you know, UofL Hospital as well as a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, how does the failure to find a partner, I mean, will that affect UofL Hospital anyway? I mean, was there a need for you know a, a new partner with kind of more financing, not just for these other facilities, but maybe for UofL Hospital too to give it a boost? You know, that might have been a situation a couple of years ago, but as I said right now, our hospital is doing very well. And I, I want to say knock on wood or, you know, it's like, but it's not, this was not to say our hospital is struggling, let's, let's see if we can find a way to do this. It was, we are financially stable right now and we have systems in place to make sure that we are, but it was truly for, is there a way that we could do something so that an institution that's been here over 100 years and has provided incredible care to so many indigent and patients, like forget indigent or not, patients, is there a way that we could keep that going? That was a big part of it. Is there, I guess from your perspective, I mean, is there a fear that 
because you guys weren't able to do that, and it sounds like you came into it because you were like, we want to make sure we can keep the, the lights on at Jewish. Mm -hmm. Are you worried that there's, I know there's no immediate impact, but are you worried? Is there a genuine fear that there could be long-term the possibility of a closure now that you got, you, they didn't reach a deal with you? I, you know, from what I've seen, they have been talking to other partners throughout the process, so we don't have visibility into that. So please remember that just because this didn't work with us, as you said, from 2017 on, they have been in conversations with other partners, and that might be well the case. All I can reassure everybody is that nothing is happening tomorrow. When we say long term, it's truly long term. A hospital of this size uh, and with the commitments they've made, we're not talking about, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next week or even next month. If it were to close, if it were to close, like, have you all, you must have some sort of thought on like what impacts that would have on U of L Hospital? Yeah, uh, it would be less on UFL Hospital itself, more on the programs that we have at the Jewish Hospital. So what I was trying to clarify is that when you look at what would happen to our hospital, we are at capacity, and everything we have there will continue. There will be no impact to our hospital. The challenge is we have several programs that are at Jewish Hospital. And so when I look at what might happen mm -hmm. to Jewish Hospital, one is what might happen to our residents. We have Oh, 56 or so. We'll get you exact numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. I've just been not, com I just want to make sure that those are accurate. But my point is the residents that are there in Jewish Hospital getting their education, that was a big focus for us. What would happen? As I do just told you, that's no longer a worry. We have an agreement in place that if something were to happen, they would be transferred back to us. And we could allocate them to any location of our choice. The second thing is the programs that we have there. Those are our programs that are being operated in those locations. So what we would have to do is find other locations for those programs. Right, but there's a lot of patients there, right? I mean, if it closes, where are those patients? Oh, absolutely. So when I say programs, it's, that's why we got into this. That's why I was telling you. The whole reason we got into this was what happens to uh, all of the patients. It fills a very vital need, emergency room visits. So. Do we just sit on the sidelines or do we at least try? And I can assure you, we gave it our all. With residents, um, so it's my understanding that sometimes it'll be the hospital itself that gets accredited for like the graduate level medical resident position. Mm. So when you say if Jewish can't find or Kentucky One can't find another place to send residents if they can't stay at Jewish, that they transfer them back to you, are you talking about transferring like the, the slots? Is, the slots. So, so Jewish controls the medical resident slots right now, right. not the medical school, but they would be transferred back to you and basically you'd have control to find them a new place to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any sense of, it seems like one of the big programs you guys have at Jewish is the transplant program, mm -hmm. which is, um, from what I understand, that's not an easy thing to just shift somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I was curious in terms of contingency planning, mm -hmm. Are do you, are you guys confident? Because that's a pretty big undertaking for another hospital to take on. So Correct. I guess I'm wondering how that process is going in terms of trying to figure out where could you possibly move such a, an important and major complex operation if there is the capacity at other institutions to do that. Um, yes, we are 100% committed to our transplant program and we absolutely have contingency plans on how we would do that. I'm not ready to give you any particular answers because we've been so laser focused on seeing if this would be done, but yes. Remember, all the employees that might be concerned and listening to this, Kentucky One still has operations in Kentucky. They have a very vibrant operation in Lexington and other places. I throw that out there to say that the state would have an interest, right? in how that's going, as well as the community would have an interest in what they're doing. So when I say there's no threat in the short term, I mean that. What is short term? I can't answer. You'd have to ask them. But the prospect of they'll close their doors tomorrow, from everything I understand, is not there. Mm -hmm. or just individual ones? Was there any one of those that was a particular problem? What role did uh, oh. Jewish hospitals, financial struggles play? Uh, happy to answer that. You know that if it were cherry picking properties, right? If you were to say, I want this, 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 there were lots of takers. The reason we stepped up was the downtown assets. 
that's clearly the problematic ones for them, for Jewish hospital. So our interest, uh, look, we're a university. Our, the teaching, research, patient care, those are our interests. The reason we got in was, is there a way that we could acquire the whole system so that we protect those downtown assets? So that's, that's the answer. And um, so yes, everybody we looked at, we said specifically, we want to be able to take on the whole system. Because, the Lexington properties. no, 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 okay. sorry. Just, just I apologize. The Louisville property. Okay. So as you know, uh, it's St. Mary's and Elizabeth. Uh, we have uh, Frazier, uh, Jewish Hospital. They have uh, Jewish East. You know, you know the different properties, and I can get you those details. So our interest was, uh, can we find a way to keep uh, the downtown assets going. Those were the ones that are financially most troubled, and so um, that's why we thought we, could, we should enter into it. How would you characterize what the negotiations with Kentucky One slash you know, CHI or Common Spirit were? I mean, obviously you guys have re reached a, a kind of uh, positive kind of approach to the next transitions, but I guess I'm wondering how those discussions went, you know, if the problem was just on your side with the partner or if the negotiations themselves, if it was also a case of, you know, not necessarily being able to reach, you know, a, a good plan kind mm -hmm. of collectively with that. I mean, clearly it was a partner and the terms on which we could get it, right? You could find a partner. The reason I was saying is it's never a simple thing of did you find a partner or not? What were the terms of the deals of the partner? What were the deals? What were the expectations from the other side to get to a deal? It's pretty complicated. And as with any seller, if you've ever had a house on the market, you get this. If you're the one who's selling, you want it sold today. If you're the one buying, you want to be careful because it's a pretty big investment and you want to make sure you're, you're. so we tried. Uh, on both sides to see uh, how we would keep it going. And um, as I said, once again, it wasn't an exclusive. I keep saying that because we didn't even demand that so that they could continue to look because our interest was candidly, if someone else came along and took over all of the facilities and would keep Jewish hospital open, that's a win for us because that's that protects what we would need to do. Does this decision to step away have any impact, or could it have any impact on accreditation, both in the short or long term? None. Uh, that's That was very, very important to us, no. Because the AAA is extended, uh, and that ha that'll have no impact. As you all say, if a Jewish hospital, you know, another buyer decides not to do that, or any other facility, it doesn't have to be that, then we would have the ability to get our student, the students, protect the students. Because the residents, if they're in that slot that the hospital has and we put them there, we wanted to make sure that they would not be jeopardized in any way. So, no, we should be fine. If, if, the Nor if the Northern Baptist CEO called you back today and said, hey, we're game, would U of L consider jumping ship for the sake of stability or are you committed to Jewish until they'll no longer have you? It's a contingency planning on both sides. So we are, it's early, but we will be sitting down with Kentucky One and saying, all right, what are our plans? What would we do? And none of these happens the way where it is, as you heard, it's not like, okay, tomorrow we're gone. We wouldn't do that. First of all, um, it wouldn't be the right thing to do. And secondly, uh, these are complicated. These are people's lives. So we need to make sure that everything is in place. So I don't anticipate anything. Uh, in the short run, it's, and what is long run, I don't know.